um, I'll just give you a, a brief intro to, I normally don't do this unless it's significant, but I do want to acknowledge at this particular point, not just the traditional people, custodians of the Adelaide Plains, but of the whole continent of Australia and a large chunk of the Lake Air Basin. And I've had the great privilege to work with many of those people, of which there's a vast number, as you'll see, spread across this significant area of Australia. Also, I want to give a special mention and an apology to a very good Aboriginal friend of mine in George Cooley, who is actually up in Cooper Pee, and he's actually working, he's come out of retirement, gone back to work for the Ulmua Local Regional Council, because I really wanted him to come down here to maybe put a bit of the Aboriginal perspective direct onto this fairly unusual event of what this map has all been about. But George sends his apologies and his best wishes and he's been one of the storms that's been there on this journey for the whole of the 12 years or so that it's gone. So he sends his uh, greetings from Cooper Pedy. So um, all that being said, um, like Lee says, the map at the moment is actually only available in a very obscure place on the AATSIS website. And if you're not familiar with AATSIS, it's the Australian Institute of Torres Strait and Islander Studies. I think very few people ever look at that website. Maybe if you Google Lake Air Basin map, you might hit on it. And it also appears on the government website of the Department of Ag and Water, which actually at the moment hosts the uh, Secretariat for the Lake Air Basin Ministerial Agreement. Yes. To start off, let's just have a little, back, little bit of background on the Lake Air Basin itself. It is a rather significant piece of the Australian landmass and continent. So you're looking at... Um, a huge chunk, as you see there, that very faint uh, map underneath of um, Australia, that it takes up nearly a third of the continent, you know, along the outlines that are here. So it is the, one of the last unregulated desert river systems in the world. That's quite unique. I know that our friend Barnaby, who was the Minister of Ag and Water, would be jumping up and down the moment desperately wanting to dam these uh, waters of the Diamantina and Georgina for really productive use instead of having them wasted, just flooding out in the lake here and evaporating. So um, it is unregulated, unlike the Murray Darling. There's no dams, no nothing. There are some obstructions out there from mining companies and others, but generally it's a free-flowing system. And the system really consists of a whole series of rivers, but the ones that you'll be familiar with uh, the Georgina and the Diamantina, which is actually flowing at this very moment from the uh, big cyclones up in the top end of Queensland. Next slide, my shot a bit better. Um, so, coming up from this end, the Georgina Diamantina is flowing at the moment into the Warburton where it crosses the border through Goyda Lagoon and ending up in the top end of Lake Eyre, Lake Eyre North, and that's what's known as the Warburton Groove, which is a deep groove that feeds that water into the North Lake. The other main feeder river is Cooper Creek, of course, which comes down this side, only flowing partially at the moment, but there is water coming down to Inaminka, it might get to Lake Hope. And the other significant event at the moment is, of course, the Air Creek, which also feeds the Georgina Diamantina system, comes in near Big Red as it's flowing at the moment and bringing another slug of water down. So at the moment, there's quite a bit of water going down, not quite as much as what the media would like you to believe, but it's certainly significant. And there's, of course, rivers on the western side, the Needles, the Macumba. Uh, there's the desert rivers that feed way out of Alice Springs, the Todd, the Fink, the Hay, the Plenty. Lots of them just disappear in the Simpson Desert and then virtually percolate underground through that desert. You've got one little river feeding out of Lake Froome down here near the Flinders Ranges and feeding into the southern end of Lake Eyre, very rarely. Um, and then, like I said, all those river systems virtually end up in what's Australia's biggest sump, because Lake Eyre is the lowest point in the land mass of Australia, some 15 metres below sea level. So, um, quite a significant and quite a diverse ecosystem. And that particular slide that we have there is actually the precursor to this Aboriginal map. So it's a bit of background, because in the early days when the Lake Eyre Basin Coordinating Committee was formed back in the late 1990s, uh, largely as a result of um, uh, a local people movement against uh, then outgoing Prime Minister Paul Keating's plan to create world heritage across Northern Territory, South Australia, Queensland and much of the river area around the Birdsville section. 
which of course was fiercely resistant. Uh, but the group that got together at that time to fight that particular proposal formed a group which was then funded and became the Lake Air Basin Coordinating Group, which is very much a community-driven event. And those people set up a whole range of projects. One was to develop a map of the Lake Air Basin, basically for people's information. That's what the old Lake Air Basin map looks like. When you look at it closely, they're still available from desert channels in Queensland, you'll find that there's very little of anything Aboriginal in that particular map. Okay, so what's in the Lake Air Basin? Well, there's a quick run through for you. It's got some of the most amazing landscapes, arid desert landscapes in Australia. It's made up of a number of different regions. The Mitchell Grass Downs, which are up in the Queensland region. The famous grazing area in the Channel Country, which at the moment, of course, is booming out of Wendora and Goida Lagoon and out of Birdsville. Um, the, Arid ranges, of which the Flinders Ranges is perhaps the most significant standout, but part of the McDonald Range is also in there. So are part of the Musgrave Ranges. So the actual watershed of Mount Woodruff, our highest mountain, actually flows on the eastern side into the Lake Air Basin. Of course, the Simpson and Stress Lakey dune fields, which are amongst one of the premium areas for people to go to and see a real desert, and the Stony Plains, which should make up a disturbed Stony Desert, of which covers a vast area and towards Inaminka and beyond right into Queensland. It has many significant places within that Lake Air Basin. Um, it has Ramsar Wetland, which is an international agreement on migratory birds and birds of significance, which is around Kungi Lakes, part of the Inaminka Regional Reserve. It has the fabulous Mound Springs, which um, go right through South Australia up the Udenodona Track and you'll no ones there like the, um, the Blanche Cup and the Bubble a bit further around, but also run right up in the Queensland area around Elizabeth Springs. And they were very significant places because they were the watering points for people travelling. Uh, Aboriginal people originally, but all the explorers later and everything that came after had to utilise them. The permanent water holes on the main and big rivers, um, many of which don't ever dry out, um, like think of Kalamara Waterhole at uh, Inaminka, and think of the big water holes if you've been to them on the Diamond Tina at, um, at um, Andrew Willa and um, around that sort of region. Um, you also have the Channel Country, of course, around Goyle Lagoon, and you have plenty of Aboriginal heritage, which is sort of throughout the whole region. These days, the Lake Air Basin is sort of mainly utilised by a number of different communities. So you have grazing and agriculture, and grazing cattle is the premium event. Um, some make a big thing about of organic grazing, sort of using no chemicals, fertilizer, whatever, and have formed organisations to do that. It has geothermal energy in different places, which we've tried to tap at different times. Certainly there's big oil and gas fields, uh, Moomba and Santos being the biggest one, but they go right through. And part of the basins, which are contentious at the moment, Galilee Basin and things like that, encroach onto it. Certainly an important area for Indigenous people uh, who now have native title rights over many of the areas and regions throughout that particular district. It's also, of course, an absolute uh, boom time for tourism at different times of the year, like presently when the lake's full. So to look after all of this, uh, after a lot of agitation and uh, the worry with the lake, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin system, the government basically got together Queensland, Northern Territory and South Australia with the Commonwealth to form an intergovernmental agreement, primarily to protect the values of this basin, particularly, particularly the water values. So it's gone through a few sort of um, morphing since. It's been reviewed a bit later than June 2007. We're just finishing a review now that will redo that whole agreement. And potentially, um, New South Wales may join it, although they just have a small sliver of the basin around the Broken Hill Silverton area. 2018 was the latest review. Um, bit of the arrangements, so you have a whole quango of uh, different government groups and uh, officials ending up in the Ministerial Forum Secretariat that manages the agreement. The key part in that is really the community and scientific advisory panels. They are the real people connections from out of the basin and from science that should go directly to the ministers for the minister to consider. It doesn't always happen. There are threats perceived in the basin, so water flow quality, vegetation clearing, the intrusion of woody weeds, particularly in Queensland, prickly acacia, prickly acacia, apple pine, 
these are all very noxious weeds on the uh, on the sort of get rid of list. Feral animals, pigs, um, camels, uh, dogs, of course, are regarded as somewhat of a bit of a problem by pastors, particularly weeds. So uh, it has also issues with gas and petroleum mining and exploration. They draw a large amount on the environment, particularly underground water, which often is noted. The basin land use is split up into a whole number of different bits of the pie, but really the most predominant land use is really pastoralism. Mining gets various <coughs> chunks of it. Conservation has its leg in there with different conservation parks and regional reserves. Tourism has a big use of all the assets in the basin and is a very important lifeblood for many of the small communities. And of course the Aboriginal element is ever getting more prominent as people are starting to reconnect the land, come back into the basin. Tourism is probably one of the biggest and most underrated drivers in the basin because it functions even when times are bad, tourists are still flowing through the Lake Air Basin. Some go there specifically, but a lot of people are transiting from the east coast going through to the north to the top end to the Kimberley. So there's a transient movement through that basin which has about 67,000 permanent residents of nearly one and a half to two million people flow through that basin. So the tourism element is very, very vital and one of the absolute lifebloods of the communities. And of course, at the moment, um, it's boom time. So whenever that lake floods or there's a rain event, then tourism jumps sky high. Um, on the last report I've had, Outback Spirits, which is one of the big tour companies that operates around Australia, are running about 80 trips into the Lake Air Basin in the next two months. There's a big lane, you can't get on his aeroplane for the next two months, let alone anything else. Trevor Wright at William Creek will probably buy another Cessna air van out of this event if it keeps on rolling for people doing scenic flights. So there's a lot of information, a lot of publicity out there. You'll see it in the papers if you read them. If you're not completely blind and bold, the yellow pages. Um, it has very significant natural heritage, uh, which is well documented from the Oak Cliffs of Lindhurst through to the desert areas, through to the wetlands. It has some fantastic historic heritage, probably the Udna Data Track in our part of the country is one of the most significant bits of historic heritage in Australia. That is a route of national significance because it covers everything from Aboriginal trade routes, through to the early explorers, through to the first uh, pastoralists and cameleers, through to the train, transport, the flying doctor, everything went up that route. So it should get recognised, but you've got some great institutions in different places. The old Freckleton store in Camelwell down the bottom, of course, the Stockman's Hall of Fame, a bit of the old uh, Silverton there, which has uh, seen in many movies, and our own bitchy Ritchie Railway down the bottom, just to name a few. Aboriginal heritage is really significant, and it's somewhat submerged because people don't see it, it's not overtly obvious, and it's not well interpreted, and we're working on it, and this map is part of that story. So you've got everything from some great rock art sites up in the Queensland area, Black's Palace is one, which is about to come back on the stream, that's a different site up in the top right hand corner. The Petroglyphs and the Flinders Ranges, of course, um, along with all of Alice Springs, the area which is also parked in the basin, so it's a very strong Aboriginal culture element. My well, mate Reggie Dodd down the bottom, you know, showing people a few bits and pieces of the lake here. So plenty happening, and like the rivers that flow through the basin, so do the tourists. So the tourists follow the flow routes and they follow the water and they follow the rivers. Now, there's a precursor to how this map came about, that in the early days of when I was working with the Lake Air Basin Committee, there was a three-state project between South Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland. And it was all about trying to highlight the amazing Aboriginal trade routes that crisscross the Lake Air Basin. Now, this is probably the most significant trading routes anywhere in Australia. So they traded everything from baler shells from the Kimberley Coast to access from Mount William in Victoria, to the pitchery that native tobacco from the Mulligan River, to grindstones from Inaminka, to ochre from Booker II and the Flinders Ranges, to baskets. So it wasn't just a huge material exchange, but it was an incredible information conduit and exchange. So this book, Making Connections, was to highlight that. It was driven very much out of Queensland and Arts Queensland, and a couple of key people behind it, one of whom, Isabel Tarago, who's currently Director of Cultural Heritage in Queensland, is um, also one of the founding members of our Lake Air Basin Map Steering Committee. So they put out this wonderful little book um, 
uh, to cover a lot of the routes through this uh, Diamantina, the river systems. Great project, and then unfortunately it sort of ended up in Queensland Arts, never got out into the proper distribution, so hardly anybody gets their hands on it and sees it. Yet it's a fantastic resource with many different chapters written by very eminent people that have worked in the Lake Air Basin, the late Dr. Louis Herkus, probably the greatest linguist of the desert area in Australia. Uh, Dick Kimber, the archetypal historian out of Alice Springs. Um, all sorts of interesting people. The late Debbie Rose Bird, wrote and contributed, including Aboriginal people like Isabel and that, to put in this of the story. So, great, but the whole work's done, and this is a part of moral of this current map story. No distribution, no marketing plan. So you, as a traveller, going on the outback trip, don't have this little book in your hand, and you should. Sitting buried in Queensland Arts at the moment, and it's a bit like raising Lazarus. I've been working to try and get it out, to get a reprint and get it to, through the societies and whatever, but it's a story. So that was going to have with it a series of interpretive sites running from the north to the south, highlighting these sites. And when I got around to that, all the parties involved said, Oh, it's too difficult, we've got to consult with too many people, take forever, cost a fortune. And all three government agencies bailed out and did that wonderful program that you know, was on ABC called Utopia, you know, where suddenly the whole scheme was just tossed out the window. <laughs> no minister was interested anymore. So let's come to this. This is the incredible journey. This is the real big. How did it all start? Well, it started because one of the absolute planks of the Ministerial Forum is all about what they then called Aboriginal engagement. You know, it's the de rigueur word. You have to have Aboriginal engagement. My Aboriginal friends hate this term. We're not getting engaged. We're not getting married. What are we talking about? And I noticed that uh, Billy Shorten has now come up with a brand new bit that I've always gone about. It's called partnership. It's a whole lot different than getting engaged. You still end up in the same bind. But anyway, um, that was one of the mantras. So how do we do it? So when we sat in this committee, there's probably 50 groups throughout the Lake Air Basin for our single facilitator coordinator or communications officer. So this is all of these talked about Lake Air Basin wasn't going to work. So we coined an idea to hold a central meeting and invite people. So we held what we called an Aboriginal forum. The first one at Hamilton Station out of Alice Springs, about 20 people went had a bit of a yabber about this and that. And then we ran the second one at Mount Searle in 2006 or something like that. Yeah, 2006 at Mount Searle. Hosted by then Charlie Jackson, who one of the other Magna group, they owned Mount Searle at the time, very important historical traditional ground for the Magna people. So we brought probably 50 people together from the basin. Commonwealth Minister of Pompeii for all this, which made it good. So the mob gathered, camped, had a good time, and the government wallers were in there, of course, wanting to talk about, what do you think about water? How do we manage the water? What are your ideas on this? What will happen with that? And the mob just, just went over the top of their heads, you know? They just totally ignored it. And I looked at all of this, being an old school teacher from way back, and thought, oh, this is going nowhere. So I got organised with the Department of Environment here, said, let's get a whole series of separate maps about where's the Aboriginal land, or who's doing what, so the whole set of things up there. And we came up with this idea, and I say that I planted the seed, and basically said, well, we've got this big Lake Air Basin map, which everybody loves, and all the tourists love, but very little Aboriginal on it. So you've got one of the most amazing landscapes in all of Australia. If you go to North Queensland, you wouldn't know an Aboriginal was there. You hear about the Combo Waterhole, and the Wartsy Matilda, and the Knowledge Tree, and uh, Everything's all white full of stuff. Our visual mob all got pushed out. There's the city of Rockhampton, Bundaberg, everywhere except in their southwest Queensland area. Said, why don't we do a map highlighting all the Aboriginal elements of Lake Air Basin? And the mob said, yeah, we really like that idea. The government wallet said, this will never work. It'll take years, it'll cost untold money. If all the consultation, all the discussion. I said, well, it doesn't have to. I said, um, why don't we take all the things that are already publicly known or there, where Aboriginal people live, what land they have, uh, where there are sites that are already recognised. Why don't we do all of that? Hmm, okay, let's start off with that. So away we went. So one of the interesting things we did there with the group, we got a huge bed sheet, and we put an Aboriginal map 
draw up, we drew up, make it based and map down below. And during the course of this forum, every individual person went up and wrote something about their country on that bed sheet. And then at the end of it, they did the usual thing, you know, dip their head in some paint and all put their handprints around it. Now the old facilitator, Bob Norris, our best facilitator ever, I think's got that bed sheet still, it's a historical item, but it started the ball rolling. So that was the beginnings of Mount Searle. When we got to the next forum, two years later, was at Birdsville. And at Birdsville, the government guys on, oh, we've got to get value out of this. We've got to, you know, get them to talk about what they want to do with water. And I said, well, they've actually been fragmented for untold years. And I said, the big thing is they're just coming together, meeting and greeting each other, finding out who's who. They're not interested in all this other stuff. You've got to take one step at a time. Oh, no, that's still too slow. So at Birdsville, I suggested to George Cooley, and I said, George, why don't we make the theme of Birdsville the trade routes? He said, yeah. We don't actually know too much about them. There must be a lot of information. I said, well, even better, you know what this whole Lake Air Basin thing is trying to do? It's trying to interconnect across borders, different interest groups who value this landscape and communicate. I said, you know what? A thousand years, your trade routes did all of that. You've already got it. What the government guys are trying to do, you've had for thousands of years. You didn't just trade axes, you didn't just trade tobacco. You exchanged ideas, you exchanged stories, you kept up ceremonies, you did land management, you had marriages. So you had the best communication network going. Well, George was highly excited. So were then a few other, the Aboriginal mob, uh, Scott Orange from up in Queensland. So at Birdsville, we made the whole focus the trade routes and talking about the trade routes. And we brought in Dick Kimber from Alice Springs. We brought in Louise Herkes, who's a revered white elder amongst many people. It was a really interesting meeting because there were about 100 people there, which to about 40 white fellows and the rest were Aboriginal mobs from different parts of the basin. And at the very last minute, um, our facilitator and key person had a family incident, couldn't come. So the whole thing is disarray. So the chairman then and a couple of us on the committee said, we're pushing it all to you, the Aboriginal committee members, you run it. And they always did run it. I mean, the Aboriginal forums didn't sit well with the apparatchiks in Canberra because they weren't run on the levels of how you run a normal conference workshop. They ran Aboriginal way, which worked really fine as far as I could see. So the Aboriginal mob ran it, and it was really interesting because part way through, we had a few young Turks in there sort of raise a bit of a ruckus about them and say a few words against Auntie Louise Herkes, well, should have seen it within about an afternoon. The elders had got to them and battered them down. You never heard a peep out of them again. So they ran it pretty strict when I wanted to. When it meant something and counted to them, they can be as tight as what you like. So out of that, the whole thing progressed further. We then got total approval from the uh, Canberra Apparatchiks. Uh, it was a project of the Community Advisory Committee it was run through the Northern Territory with our then uh, communications coordinator, the lovely Michelle Rodrigo, and Bob Norris, our then facilitator, who did fabulous jobs, two best people you could ever find to run something like this. So we literally split along. It took time talking to people, getting ideas, and we then also got a graphic designer. This was then the ultimate challenge. Peter Campbell, the graphic designer, based out of the back blocks of New South Wales and Canberra, this was an immense task. How do you create something like this with this many different elements and layers? So he and his team really took to it and it had to be different to anything else because the whole content was different. So he really put his mind to it and by Tipperborough, which was the last Aboriginal form in 2011, we actually had a draft concept map that looked a little bit like we've got now, but the colour schemes were there, there were a few other features in it, um, one feature that doesn't reappear was there, was underlying that map was a hand. Because the Aboriginal people, a lot of Aboriginal people, when they see the Lake Air Basin, they see a hand. The palm is the lake, the fingers are the river that's running into it. So we thought that was pretty powerful, but it was just too subtle and buried in all the things that had. We also had, with the map, because we wanted to explain more, to develop a book with about 18 or 20 pages to give some background to the map, which means we wouldn't overload the map. So we wrote four or five chapters, it all went along. 
But then about 2015, um, we got to the point, we got to the point, I don't know, was when Mr Abbott became our Prime Minister, the whole world changed in the environment. So he went to shred every department he saw wasn't that useful, apart from the ABC, and uh, went ahead and put serious inflictions on our funding and also um, the Lake Air Basin Ministerial Forum moved from the Department of Environment to the Department of Agriculture and Water. Now, if ever there was a misfit of ideology and ideas, that would have to be it. Goes into a major development department when it's really about protecting values of the environment. And of course, their minister was a good friend, Barnaby. So we got very serious. Uh, the relationship between the Community Advisory Committee and Canberra really deteriorated from that point on. But the worst thing that happened was the new head honcho of the Ministry of Reform looked at this and said, oh, this has been going for nearly 11 years or 10 years, this is going too long. Put out an edict, said, we're taking it away from the Northern Territory. Um, you have to hand everything over and have it finished within six months by the end of June of that year. And we said, well, that's not how things work. No, Aboriginal people don't work like that. We can't put that deadline on. Yes, we want to finish it, but it has to run its course. He stuck to his guns. We handed over the map, it was incomplete. Um, it then sat with Canberra and we thought, okay, well, this will get things moving. And then it all went shtum for six months, we heard nothing. At the fire up a meeting in Brisbane, at which um, we then sort of brought in by subterfuge Isabel Tarago to speak to that gathering of uh, government people and community members and actually explain what this map was all about. And boy, did she throw the spears into them. She was a very powerful lady in Queensland. She could pick up the phone to Barnaby or whoever and get an answer. So she said, you are just, there are people out there that are waiting for this. This is the engagement process that's all that's been happening. And if we don't deliver this, there'll be some heavy penalty to pay. And she said, nothing like this has ever been done. She said, this is unique. You need to get on with it. So anyway, we had a head honcho run around and say, well, why is it stalled? They said, well, we're just getting all the provenance in to make sure that everybody signed off on it and to make sure that everything's correct. And we haven't got any sign off on the trade routes, he said to me. I said, really? I said, come over here, Chris. Aunt Isabel said, Chris thinks we can't move without sign off on the trade routes. Well, she gave him a withering glare and said, trade routes? Nobody owns them. Can't sign off on them. They belong to everybody there. And anyway, I've written them all about them in my book, in Making Connections. They're already out there. Oh, okay. That made me a blocker. They went forensically through and challenged everything in the Northern Territory into provenance and everything. So just stalled, stalled, stalled. And then they got their lawyers in because what was their biggest fear? Some person, when this map got out, published under the Commonwealth moniker, was going to throw a spear of dispute at them and say, we don't agree with that. And we said, okay, well, it's all provenance. And I said, um, there's actually a map out there. It's called the Aboriginal language map by a guy called Horton, which is highly controversial for lots of Aboriginal people. And there's lots of disputes. So I said, this one might be anywhere that brief. Anyway, to cut it all short, we moved on. And the biggest thing that happened was the then definitely the Uber leader saw and I said, this is the best feel good thing you're ever going to get politically in this basin. He could see the lights went up in his eyes and off he went, I'll take personal charge. Back at the number two, a bit around the ears, and away we went. Now, to make this work, we set up a set of these project principles. They're very important, they're written on the map. Again, when the Commonwealth went to print the foreign map, they thought they should be left off. I said, no way, they are the fundamental of what happens. So, they're very commonsensical, okay? Non-contestable information, nothing on there should be controversial, which I don't think it is, nobody's yet complained, except for Reggie Dodge, but I'll do that as an afterthought. Um, it's got to be comfort with publicity, it's got to be harmonious, it's got to be a balance between the different elements, the message has got to be clear, Content's got to be determined through consultation, so everything had to be vetted. Even if it was published in a book, we had to go back through the museum or that to the relevant group to say, yes, it's okay to reuse it. And of course, it had to have an inclusiveness of everybody 
a timelessness because the map basically was going to stand for a long time. It wasn't going to have to be amended and a good spatial balance. So the principle was very important, very well adhered to. Okay. And then here was the nightmare for Peter Campbell. This map was just an incredible series of layers, as you see when you look at it. And on those layers, all these things had to happen. Language and tribal boundaries are a really contentious issue, and they get fought about in court in native title agreements between mobs that are claiming you know, different bits and pieces. Here, we made a very easy bit, no boundaries. We just put the language names over the top of the region where they were. There's some 70 distinctive languages in the Lake Air Basin. They're distinctive nation groups in that area. The trade routes were going to be shown, and they're marked in there, the little black feet that run through it. The rivers and water place, of course, are most important. We nearly named all of them, tried to find the Aboriginal names. The national parks, the managed lands, the Aboriginal names for towns, where we could fit them in. Um, we made a few small changes. We didn't put Mark Mancua for um, Alice Springs because we thought nobody would recognise that easy, so we put Alice Springs big and the Aboriginal name small. But in other places, it's big Aboriginal name, small European name. Um, big connecting stories that run through because this place is like a spider web. It's crisscrossed with ancestral dreaming pathways. Uh, Bruce Chapman turned the, the term song lines, which even Aboriginal people now use, but it's not an Aboriginal concept. Song does go with the storylines, but the pathways of ancestral beings that people follow. And they're all through that lake. Dick Kimball recount, you know, travelling out with uh, old Walter Smith, who was one of the last Simpson Desert men. He walked it in for two and a half days. Walter will be singing songs of country all the way down, and every song was telling him something about where he was going. Better roadmap than the RAA. So um, the stories, there's some examples in there. Then they had to be cleared, they had to be published. So we used the Louise Herkes ones, which is good. The roads and, of course, the amenities and an absence of state borders. When the map came back finally, Canberra said, oh, but you haven't put the borders in. I said, no, it's deliberate. There are no borders. There were no borders. This is a map about us. We're not putting in the borders. People can see and know where the borders are. They had to chew on that one, but the steering committee was very all-powerful. So you have the language names, OK, all through the place over different areas. Um, the circles that are there in yellow are around major trade routes and trading centres. You see the little black feet running through there. Well, we had a set of white arrows going up and down for a while, showing the trade routes went backwards and forwards. And then when we had a final meeting of the steering committee, we said, well, there should really be footprints. And then we had a series of white footprints. and said, yeah, but there are Aboriginal people walking through here. I said, yeah. So bit by bit, it evolved, you know. It was, a lot of talk and discussion to do it. The trade routes are really the hub of this map along the waterways. And of course, they link and they follow the waterways, as you can see. And they're fantastic. And you can experience them as you travel on your travels. You know, major trading centres uh, just out of Anna Creek, is a major centre, of course, around the Birdsville track at Lake Hill up in Inner Copramana, around Inaminka, Birdsville itself, uh, up in Goyda Lagoon. The dreaming tracks, which we called uh, the dreaming pathways, the two boys dreaming, which comes out of Alice Springs. We specially chose ones, and Louise Herkes was a principal mover in this, that actually crossed tribal boundaries because these dreaming trails went from one to the other and they actually linked people and they linked stories. Probably one of the biggest examples is the Seven Sisters Dreaming, which runs from just out of the back of Iron Knob of Wyala all the way to Exmouth through diagonally through Australia. And you can follow, if you know, that story all the way through with different parts held by different people. So, and they're explained on there. Um, because the Commonwealth decided we won't publish the book, we had to overload the map a little bit. But the book's still there in the back box to maybe redo. Water places all named um, with Aboriginal place names, and we named all the significant ones. And then surrounding the map is the really unique aspect. This is the thing that makes a different part from the information layer, because you have three information layers around that map, but the most significant part is you have the portraits of 120 or so Aboriginal people on that map. Now, if you have any familiarity, you'll know that Aboriginal people are very reticent often to have their pictures in anywhere, and often if they're deceased, of course, all things eradicated or raised. So 
we even got the okay for people who'd passed away to be in that map. So our Auntie Linda Crombie, who was a great uh, Morgan Guru elder up in uh, Birdsville, is in that map with her granddaughters fishing on the banks of the river, amongst others, and others have passed away. So they're all happy. They all had to sign off on this. It all had to be signed on paper. You, you would not believe the process and procedure because the Commonwealth was basically sort of mentoring this project, even if it wasn't theirs, was the Aboriginal peoples. So, so you have um, those photos in there make it really significant. And they're people of all ages, all doing different things. All acknowledged, all accredited. You have the Lake Deer Basin story, Kakitunda. Uh, a bit of controversy over that, because different Aramana people have different story. And Reg Dodd is very uptaken with that story. He thinks it's not the right one. But old Six String Waves, who's a more senior Aramana elder, that's his story. So we've just accredited as a story as per Six String Waves, not the story as per everybody. It's a story that national parks use. So that's the story of Kati Tumla Lake Air. Planning the images, well, there is a set of early prehistory type images, um, as much as what we could get. As you see, the portraits, the other photos, pre-settlement, post-settlement and contemporary. So we had three layers going through that map that highlight different elements. And one of the really beautiful things about this is the final process when we had the last draft done we then took it around to at least the declared native title bodies in different places. And with some of them, like when I was talking to the Yarrawaka, Yandrawonka here in South Australia, the Inamika people, everybody was highly excited about this map, didn't want to hear about consultants talking about what camera wanted, they just want to look at this map, see who's in it. They'd come up and said, oh, that's my grandfather there on that photo. I said, great, what's in the Who goes over to you? This is uh, all sorts of bit of extra information filled it in after we you know, gone through the process. So it just keeps on stirring up a whole lot of things that uh, go through it. So there's early bits, you know, the sketch of um, uh, Howard coming in and finding King, uh, weapons, um, message sticks, the images, and the last step was the graphic check, getting approval, and um, then came the big bit. The steering committee's job was done. See you later, goodbye. You've been really nasty and horrible to us in Canberra. You know, like you've stuck spears in us all the way, which we had to do. And then they cut us dead. And then, to me, the last ignominity of this whole deal, there was a great idea. It was actually made by one of the head honchos in Canberra because said, well, well, the Department of Native Water is not comfortable with having this and distributing it and dealing with it. Like, it's not our business, it's not our core business. So he had the thought, well, Maybe we should head at the Institute of Aboriginal Studies. I said, yep, well, that was set up to be a keeping place of all things Aboriginal. They lost their way, didn't last 10 years with native title things, but really that's what they are, so they should do it. Great idea, really bad execution. And their bad execution was that Canberra, Department of Aboriginal Water, negotiated with the Institute of Aboriginal Studies without involving any of the people that spent most towards their life on this map. So I've got no idea what cameras institutes got, but not much. Because basically, they've just got handed a product, done and dusted, and said, sell it through your network. Well, they have a bookshop and online area because they publish. So it sits on the ATSIS map, and you can purchase it there plus postage, and it's out of sight, out of mind. It doesn't go there. So the whole intent of this map was threefold. It was to bring the partnership of people together. It was actually the core of the so-called engagement plan. Since the forums, this is all the engagement that has been. The other part of it was, it was supposed to raise the awareness of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people throughout the basin about the Aboriginal landscape. And it's supposed to be an educational tool because this is a fantastic resource for schools. So the unfinished business is, the booklet needs to be done, a school's package for teachers needs to be done. Every school in the basin should have this map and use it as part of their project work. So it's, a, it's an incredible detailed resource that unfortunately has been slightly bodgy by how our government systems work. Because as far as the government is concerned, there's a pile of money spent, it's acquitted, it's audited, tick it, forget it, put it like a report up in a shelf, hand it to somebody else, don't worry about it and think that everything be hunky-dory. Well, it isn't. 
There's a few mean terriers left in the old group that are going to move this. And uh, I guess the sort of moving that needs to happen is to achieve exactly this for it to interpret the Aboriginal, Aboriginal landscape. So one of the things in my dying days on the committee was to move a motion that we fund at least eight of these maps to be put on big signs in key interpreted areas, just as a beginning, because we then want to bring in some of the um, big sponsors that uh, help promote this, like Santos, like DHP Billiton, the Queensland Shires, and get a whole set of them that should be out there on interpreted sites in the basement at the Whitten Dinosaur Museum, at the Two, uh, Two Boys Dreaming Site in Birdsville, at the Mungarani Interpretive Shelter, at Maree. So these need to go in some key sites to highlight this sort of landscape and what it's all about. There's the shelter at Lake Air South, which was put up earlier in the piece and has a big Aboriginal map in it. Um, the Lake Air Basin map, you can see it down the bottom there. So out of this project, in that shelter will go a really big Aboriginal map to complement it. And it should be, and as I talked to a whole group of tour operators the other uh, end of last year at Port Augusta, said every one of your key iconic locations should have one of these framed up in your most visible place. So I planted that seed, I'll go and see how it happens. But that's really a core part of how to interpret Lake Air Basin and how to bring it to life and create some reality with it all. Um, and it's a key to a part now as a tool to keep further participation involved because now Aboriginal people have got the drift of what happens, they've got the connections, now they're willing and want to contribute to how we manage the nitty gritty of the water, the landscape, and all those things. Before they had to come together, they had to form, storm, discuss things, and you know, I take real umbrage when some bureaucrat in Canberra says, this has taken way too long, you know, the project should be finished. That person had no idea. It's a sad indictment of where we are today, in my view, because he didn't understand one hui about what this did. Actually, his ministers kept raising all this Aboriginal stuff as the most important thing in the ministerial reports at the end of every year. It's the one thing they all supported and they all wanted. And then it sort of partly got short change, but it won't end up that way for too long. So it is an amazing story about an amazing landscape. And like I said, the journey, unfortunately, not over. It's got to go the next way, because until that map saturates through the basin, until the Institute understands that there needs to be a marketing and distribution plan, that every visitor information centre in the basin needs to have 20 or 30 maps like we have here at the RGSSA that are there on site when a person's travelling in that country and they can pick it up. Sitting on a website in Canberra is as good as useless. So that's the big challenge and uh, we'll get there. And gradually filtering through the information bits with people like you, the society and others, you know, it'll gradually get the message out there. So it is a significant part, and Aboriginal people in the basin are incredibly proud of this. And, and the other thing they were really concerned, in one of the last discussions about that it has copyright, this and that, said forget it, that it's meaningless. This map belongs to the Aboriginal people of Lake Air Basin. The Institute of Aboriginal Studies is the custodian of your map. Anything that gets done with that map has to be cleared back with your representatives. So you can't just do anything around with it. Doesn't matter if it has copyright, Commonwealth of Australia, meaningless. It is the property and belonging and a gift, in my view, from Aboriginal people of the Lake Air Basin who are reconnected and still connected to all of us and all of Australia. And I close with the words of Auntie Isabel Tarago, because when she finally handed it into me, she said, Nothing like this has been done in Australia before, she said. This is unique, this is liquid gold, and this is what closing the gap is all about. I'll leave it with her words. I'm happy for questions.